Welcome to, to the inaugural edition of ISO Plaza series organized by Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. I'm your host, as well as the moderator of today's panel discussion, Stephen Poon. We are here at the broadcast, pleased to welcome our online audience who has just joined us from around the regions. In a few moments, I will introduce the panelists for the panel discussion for our virtual session, Integrated Sustainability, Innovation for Wellbeing. Simultaneously, you can also use the Q&A function to submit your questions to our speakers. Very good evening to all the distinguished panels. Indeed, to our online audience from different parts of the regions, May I say welcome again to the inaugural edition of ISO Plaza series of the theme panel discussion of in integrated sustainability, innovation for well-being. We have a very diverse panel with the different experiences, with also a very diverse expertise. And I'm sure, like me, all of you are looking forward to hear the views from all of them. Now we have three panelists, excluding me. And I want to make sure that we get to hear from each of them. A quick background of the, dis um, of the today's discussion. Pluralism towards a cosmopolitan understanding of well-being, we approach innovation as hybrid, conceptual, contextual, and global. Instead of focusing on a single discipline or medium or embracing a singular philosophy, we choose to underscore our role as a platform for debate within the field. Our core values are those of an inclusive cosmopolitan society that embraces sustainability in every aspect. Before we kick off the session, I would like to bring everybody through the first panel topic. Drone technology is being applied and utilized to expand the device's functionality and usefulness in sustainability development. The advancement of drone technology exceeds authorities' ability to control it. Indeed, drones are powerful tools, but must be used properly and within guidelines in place if they are exist with sustainable development initiative in the field. I would like to introduce our first panelist, Muhammad Fuad Muhammad Isa. Fuad holds a master in manufacturing engineering from RMIT University, Australia, and currently pursuing his PhD in UTM Kuala Lumpur. He is one of the MUDAS, Malaysia Unmanned Drones Activist Society EXCO member, and has more than five years of drone piloting experience. He holds also Malaysian Skills Certificate Level 2 in drone piloting. Please welcome Mr. Muhammad Fua Muhammad Isa. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Hi. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good evening to everybody. My name is uh, Muhammad Fuad bin Muhammad Isa and uh, I'm a uh, ESCO member of Malaysia UAV Drone and Activist Society MUDAS. Uh, actually, I'm a government official who works in the uh, Human Resource Ministry and uh, involved in the development of job in my team. 
and I was involved in the development of uh, skills development for the drone uh, standards. Uh, so our NGO Omudas is actually uh, we are an organization in Malaysia uh, that are dedicated to uh, development and environmental. Uh, uh, social responsibility as well as uh, about the, the drones, uh, the properly created sustainability for the well-being of the society. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so we have uh, gone through a lot of uh, terms and uh, uh, words that some people call drone, some people call UAV, and some people call UAS. So I would like to, before we go further, I would like to explain what's the difference between those. So uh, UAV is actually uh, unmanned aerial vehicle or commonly known as a drone. So most people uh, prefer to call a drone, but in terms of uh, technical terms, it's actually an unmanned, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle or UAV. So UAV is actually a tool or device that being used uh, to capture data and remotely controlled by a pilot or a drone operator uh, and transmitted the signal uh, from the operator to the to the drone and transmit back to the ground station and those information or data can be in term of uh, image or video feed uh, to the monitors so the whole system is actually we call n man uh, area system or uas so in this case, we are not talking about the UAS, but we are talking about the, the uh, UAV, uh, the, how the, the application of the UAV itself. Okay, uh, in, the recent in the recent advances of the information technology and uh, artificial intelligence, in terms of sensing, batteries, and uh, analytical uh, technologies, uh, as well as the autonomous navigation methods, uh, have led to the design of the chip of the cheaper, uh, reliable, and easier uh, to operate drones. So with the ability to capture large uh, contents or large uh, collections of uh, images or videos, along with the visual data processing uh, capabilities uh, into 3D models, this platform is becoming uh, an exciting uh, innovation. OK. So. This is the common application of UAV that uh, most most everybody knows. As you can see from the photos here, uh, mostly uh, drones being used in preliminary site survey for construction, for example, and then some drones also can be used for search and rescue, illegal logging, water pollution, wildlife, wildlife, uh, wildlife protection, real estate, and as well as uh, agriculture. So initially, the drones are actually uh, being used by the military. Uh, where they use uh, drone for the anti-aircraft target and spying and later on now uh, being used as a weapon system. But now uh, drone being used in civilian roles such as uh, search and rescue and so on. So this is an example that I've been uh, listed here. But actually it's a lot of, uh, lot of applications that can be used uh, using drone. Uh. Uh, for example, uh, other than this, it's actually uh, for traffic monitoring. You can use drone for traffic monitoring, or uh, even uh, weather monitoring, uh, firefighting, or natural disaster monitoring, uh, and also in a business for marketing. Okay, so a lot more uh, applications coming forward uh, in terms of a drone uh, application, and this technology is becoming. Um, and a uh, very fast uh, and very dynamic uh, technology nowadays. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I would like to bring uh, all of you uh, in three contexts uh, of drone technology and uh, sustainability development. Um, number one is the surveillance and mapping. Uh, what is the, uh, uh, the impact of the drone usage or drone technology in in term of surveillance and mapping and then uh, in term of transportation what drones can uh, bring us uh, to uh, a, a better uh, future uh, and then uh, what are other specification or other uh, applications that can uh, a drone uh, contribute to us so 
Number one is surveillance and uh, mapping. Uh, this is the two uh, major applications of uh, drone technology. So most uh, of the uh, agriculture right now, uh, industries, agriculture industries use drone uh, to do a survey, uh, to do a mapping on their crops. Uh, why? Because the, the drone are capable to collect data in such uh, big areas of land. Uh, so the use of drones not only uh, for small areas, but now uh, they use a, a bigger size of drone, for example, a vertical takeoff and landing system, a VTOL drone, or maybe a fixed-wing a fixed wing drone, uh, where those drones can fly um, more than 100 acres. So this, this, this technology is beyond uh, what we have uh, think before. So apart from that, for um, mapping and surveillance, uh, we can use a drone also to do a monitoring of the wildlife, uh, whereby the, the drone can uh, survey a large areas of uh, land uh, uh, and also um, to protect uh, wildlife, whereby some of the areas that uh, 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 we cannot uh, go uh, through the physical uh, methods. So we use a, a drone uh, uh, to do that uh, on behalf of us. And uh, apart from that, uh, deforestation also can be uh, minimized by using of drones, uh, where we can use uh, data from the surveillance and also from the mapping uh, to see the encroachment areas of the uh, forest. And also from that, we can uh, estimate the, the, the number of uh, forests that are being uh, destroyed uh, 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 unconditionally. So this is one of the areas that are uh, drone that being uh, widely used. And then um, apart from that, um, in terms of uh, transportation, uh, so nowadays transportation uh, is placed uh, 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 plays an important role uh, because the sectors, uh, this uh, transportation evolve uh, continuously drone and apart from that, uh, uh, the use of drones uh, in uh, some areas, for example, uh, with a limited road infrastructure, so we can use drone to transport uh, a cargo, for example, a parcels uh, to other places in a very short time. Uh, and then uh, maybe some areas um, for remote area for for example um, like island uh, we can send a parcels or we can send a medical supplies even a medical supplies uh, to that island uh, to to assist uh, the community there. Um, apart from that, uh, we can use now. There is uh, some research uh, that uh, grown rapidly to be done now on the on the air taxis or uh, air mobility. Um, uh, what what is all about is that um, drone in future we predict or uh, we expect that the drone can bring a passengers, and uh, they are already demonstrated their technical capability. Capability, though there are there are few uh, prototypes that that been uh, developed right now uh, in some countries, and uh, a few uh, models have been tested uh, between the cities. And uh, it shows that uh, this technology uh, is can uh, this technology could be realized soon. So maybe in future, about maybe five to ten years, we don't know. But uh, again, uh, this is not a simple things. Um, a lot of things, um, a lot of research uh, in terms of uh, how uh, how the, the the air taxis or the passenger drones can be deployed. And how we do uh, the maintenance? Uh, where is where is the specific areas for the people to 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 go on board and so on? A lot of things that that need to be uh, done. So um, in terms of uh, law and uh, enforcement, also a lot of countries still uh, looking forward to to uh, study on the on the impact of these uh, drone taxis or passenger drones toward the society. But anyway, this is one of the um, uh, future that uh, we may uh, face uh, within 10, maybe to 15 years soon. 
Okay, so that about the transportation and lastly about the appliances or tools. This uh, application actually, uh, I would like to raise about the specific application, specific application of the drones in terms of uh, some areas whereby, for example, the precision agriculture and forestry. Precision agriculture is that uh, rather than we spraying the entire field, we can use uh, a drone to, to uh, uh, to spray uh, on the right spot only, so we said so that we can minimize the usage of the pesticide. Uh, we can uh, reduce the collateral damage and also uh, enhance the cost efficient. <clears throat> and then uh, in disaster response, for example, uh, drone can help uh, the humanitarian uh, workers, environmentalists, uh, and and some uh, disasters. Uh, for uh, for example, natural disasters such as uh, mudslides, earthquake. And floods can be uh, the I mean the I mean the the assist the assistance from the the agencies can be uh, delivered very fast by using a drone, so they can uh, able to locate and uh, to locate the victims with the help of uh, cameras on board. And then uh, lastly, um, the medical services, as I mentioned before. Even though right now there's no ambulance, drone ambulance, but then uh, there's a potential uh, studies, there's a potential research on how we can uh, send a medical device uh, throughout the drone to uh, remote areas. And it can bring uh, something like, um, for example, um, uh, oxygen tank, for example, a small oxygen tank uh, uh, to reach the patient with a cardiac arrest or similar condition so that uh, before the, the actual ambulance come. So this is one of the uh, potential areas that uh, the, the technology can help us uh, in the near future. And then uh, all of this actually come again, come back to the regulatory framework. So a lot of uh, agencies uh, around the world, okay, led by uh, FAA, uh, ESA, European uh, Aviation and Safety Agencies, and even in Malaysia, CAM, Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia, they are working together. Uh, on uh, how to uh, regulate the framework, the correct framework uh, on the drone uh, uh, applications. So we're still uh, looking forward into the very uh, firm uh, system uh, from the agencies. Okay, and then um, now uh, we know that uh, drone has been sent to Mars okay, last, last April. So this is one of the examples that uh, a drone is actually is very uh, um, um, dynamic or very uh, futuristic uh, tools that are beyond our thinking before. So uh, a lot of things or a lot of application can be uh, can be done through the through the drone itself. But then a lot of research uh, need to be carried out. So this is one of the of the greatest achievement of uh, mankind. Uh, for this year, whereby we can we send uh, a drone uh, to Mars. All right. Uh, so uh, with a very short time, I think uh, uh, I give back to uh, uh, to the Dr. Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Surveillance and monitoring are two major applications of drone technology. Yes, drone surveillance and mapping can help protect wildlife and stop deforestation, according to what Fuad just said. Drones can survey, you know, survive and also large areas of land, such as protected areas and agricultural land. Drones can also serve a wide range of other applications depending on which features and software are incorporated into them. Thank you, Mr. Fuad, um, Mr. Muhammad Fuad, Muhammad Isa. Coming up, our second panelist, architect Sali Adre Sakum. Sali is an architecture futurist, sustainability proponent and design activist. He is an award-winning architect helming his firm SA Square. He is past deputy president of PAM Palm, Malaysia Institute of Architects, and also past president of MGBC, Malaysia Green Building Council. He is the current chairperson for development of the Malaysian Carbon Grading Tool. Sully's topic focused on the carb carbon footprint measurement allows for effective and focused reduction 
um, efforts in the building and construction industry. The grading system developed by Malaysia Green Building Council is envisioned to be in inclusive and work in conjunction with most of the relevant green building rating tools as an additional layer to it. Here we are. Please welcome architect Sali Adri Sakum. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Stephen, for that kind introduction. Um, waiting for my slides. Yeah, thank you very much. So we'll be talking today about the importance of a carbon grading tool for the building uh, industry in Malaysia. Uh, it's our sort of an overview because I think I only have like about eight or ten minutes. Um, a bit, bit. Thank you for the introduction. I think uh, I, I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Uh, more importantly is my involvement in the Green Building uh, Council, uh, as well as propagating uh, or educating people about green. Yeah, And I think that, that is very important because uh, topics like carbon can be very, very confusing. So I'll try to keep it as, as simple as possible so that uh, it will reach uh, as far an audience as possible. So at the very core of it, we have climate change. And uh, this is taken from the National Geographic movie, Six Degrees Could Change the World, whereby it's only six degrees that you can have a global wipeout. And we are now at two degrees here, where our coral reefs are dying. And soon, uh, even now, you can see so many uh, global phenomena that has happened due to the changes of temperature. And why is this so? Uh, related with carbon is that carbon is the matrix that we use uh, to actually measure climate change, uh, greenhouse gases, yeah? And it's in reality, uh, it is a very serious thing because we must see the overall picture uh, and what more uh, better view than uh, to have to look at our Earth from, from the satellite view. And you can clearly see that that our areas for ice uh, are shrinking drastically, uh, both uh, on the Arctic and the Antarctic. These are images from NASA. And um, looking at the global picture, uh, what we need to look at is what is it, wh what is the world doing to stop this? Yeah. So we have an organization called the UNFCC which stands for the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change. This is a, a body under the UN uh, and is the parent uh, to both the Paris Agreement in 2015 and the 1997 uh, Kyoto Protocols. The convention uh, has a near universal membership of 197 parties, uh, meaning that all these countries are agreed to it, uh, especially with regard to the 2015 Paris Agreement. Uh, the main aim of the Paris Agreement is to keep the global average temperature rise this century as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. If you remember just now the, the degree changes that I showed you, the whole thing about the Paris Agreement was just to reduce uh, to make sure that our temperature do not increase more than 1.5 degrees Celsius globally. And they maintain something which is really important called the Nationally Determined Contributions, DT, uh, NDC. So this is what each country uh, contributes and each country declares as their target. Yeah. So with regard to uh, the Paris Agreement, as I mentioned, we have all these 197 countries. Uh, we have... Uh, we have the total that the almost all the countries in the world uh, are party to this agreement uh, in Paris, and it was here. If you if you ever heard the word uh, sustainability development goals, it was here. It was coined. It was here that they set the targets for 2030, and it was here. If you can check uh, at the UNFCC website, whereby all the countries report. And even uh, Malaysia, we had we just uh, sent in our revised report for 2021. So what Malaysia has uh, promised is that Malaysia intends to reduce economy-wide carbon intensity against GDP of 45% in 2030 compared to 2005 levels. The updated uh, national determined contributions include the following increased ambition. The 45% of carbon intensity, intensity reduction is unconditional. The target is an increase of 10% from the earlier submission and 
the GHG coverage uh, is uh, expanded to seven greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, which is the main one, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, perfluorocarbon, sulfur hexafluoride, and nitrogen uh, trifluoride. So these are the main uh, NGC for Malaysia. Yeah. And why buildings? Yeah, you might ask why 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 such a big fuss about buildings, because buildings actually generate nearly 40% of annual global greenhouse gas emissions. If you look at this uh, table that I have, uh, this is taken from the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction. Yeah, it's a part of the 2018 Global Status Report, whereby you can see that building operations account to 28%, whereas uh, building materials, 11%. Uh, and when people, a lot of people think that it's transportation that actually can, uh, actually contributes a lot, but buildings contribute more, right? We just don't see it. But we can see smoke coming out of a car, but you can't see when you plug in, uh, say, uh, your TV, you don't see smoke coming out. But actually, there is somewhere in the country or in the world that people are burning fossil fuels to produce electricity for you, yeah? And uh, to make matters worse is we have uh, a growth of floor area, which is tremendous. We are about to reach uh, about 5 million uh, trillion floor areas uh, in square, square feet in 2060. And that, uh, to put that into perspective, the global building stock will double uh, by 2060. That means we have doubled the buildings that we have now. We expect uh, to add 2.4 trillion square feet, uh, which is like 230 billion meters square of new floor area to the global building stock. To put that into perspective, what that means is we're adding an equivalent of an entire New York City every month for 40 years continuously. That's what it means to, uh, in terms of our development intensity. So sometimes when you read the figure, you don't, you don't think about uh, the scale, but imagine this whole uh, city of New York every month for 40 years so it's immense and uh what what the what world green building council uh wants to do is that it has launched an advancing net zero uh we already had uh, uh green buildings and well-being for people as a, as a previous team but now we are looking at um advancing net zero as one of the uh, important things because we really need to push the number of uh carbon contributions but from buildings as I, as I showed you just now to to zero in order for us to meet uh, a lot of these targets yeah and there is uh, globally uh, net zero snapshots by each country yeah and why we need a measurement tool is that you can't manage what you can't measure yeah, it's a very famous saying by Peter Drucker. So we need something to measure this carbon holistically or else uh, it's very difficult to measure carbon uh, because uh, it is something that you don't see. Yeah, It's inherent in the energy that you use and the energy that you use might not be the same. If you use, uh, say, for example, electricity in Sabah and Sarawak, it might be cleaner than Semenanjung, Malaysia because they have a lot of hydro. Here we don't. So the energy mix for a country also plays a a, diff, uh, a factor. It's a very, very complicated thing. So we need a tool that that can measure things for buildings so that uh, we can report uh, to the uh, in terms of the building performance as well as the uh, international level. Yeah. And Malaysia GBC uh, has undertaken a roadmap uh, from our inception till today uh, to improve uh, to improve this vision of re of sustainability and now we are incorporating uh, in this roadmap of ours uh, the net zero uh, carbon tool because it is the next step because prior, previous to that we had uh, supported a lot of uh, green rating tools and one of the green rating tools that we support is green building index but i think as we are moving forward to creating net zero carbon it is uh, timely that we do so and when you look at uh, the roadmap, it is one of the integral parts that we are looking at uh, reporting to the uh, World GBC and uh, deploying a private project for the net zero carbon.
And what is the carbon tool all about is to create an overarching system to measure the carbon footprint of a building in order to create an aspiration to reach net zero and ultimately net zero carbon. So it's an aspirational tool. That means that, of course, you measure today, you won't get zero immediately. You will do a strategy that slowly you work towards net zero. So that's why uh, the most apt thing to say is that uh, it is towards net zero. And uh, we have four sub criteria underneath the tool, uh, which is energy, uh, basically the energy used by the building. Primar primarily, it is electricity, but there's also some component of gas and diesel, uh, according to building. Uh, water, uh, the carbon footprint of the water usage in the building. Uh, waste, yeah, the, what, what you throw away and how you treat your waste. Uh, and the periphery. And this is where transport uh, also comes in because uh, the footprint of the building also includes the transportation uh, that brings people into the building and whatnot. Uh, the process simply is that uh, if you look at that black box, is measure the baseline of your carbon uh, in kilos and tons, uh, improve and upgrade uh, with your strategies and whatnot, then remeasure again uh, uh, as what is improvement, then you will get your net. Then every year you will, every year, every month, you will get these readings uh, over and over. And every year you will look at how to improve further until you reach zero. And all this will uh, contribute uh, through, uh, throughout the lifespan of the building, which is typically 50 years. And that becomes a life cycle analysis for the buildings. So this is um, to help reporting uh, at the national level uh, and also at the UNFCC level. Yeah. And of course, uh, once we have all this data, uh, we can further improve the existing building stocks because one of the most important things that we must change is the, in the existing building stock. A lot of uh, green building tools are very successful at doing new buildings, uh, at reducing the impact uh, of new buildings, but very seldom existing buildings are involved in the fray. So these... Uh, Net zero carbon uh, grading system is aimed towards uh, existing buildings uh, more so. And I would like to end with this quote. Uh, we are running the most exper dangerous experiment in history right now, which is to see how much carbon dioxide the atmosphere can handle before there is an environmental catastrophe. So this, this is Elon Musk who said this, and uh, this guy makes a lot of sense because we are really uh, gambling here. We don't know what limit uh, the earth can take, uh, but we, if we go business as usual without considering um, the, the consequences, we are definitely headed for disaster. And of course, buildings uh, are a huge contributor to that, hence the relationship to what we have to do. With that, uh, I hand back to our moderator, Dr. Stephen. Right, it's a quick recap and re-emphasize of what Sally just said. In the development of it, we are looking at aligning ourselves with the process firstly to design and implement the national-centric net zero carbon grading system in line with the aspiration WGBC, which work with really, uh, our Green Building Council. Secondly, to align with the national NDC, nationally determined contributions and contribute to national carbon reporting to UNF, Triple C, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thirdly, to ensure a synergistic and symbiotic outcome when used in any situation which has already initiated effort within SDGs, which is the Sustainable Development Goals, and ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance. Lastly, to synergistically work and enhance green ratings tools such as the GBI, Green Building Index, and other tools in the current industry. Thank you for the enlightenment. Thank you so much, uh, Architect Sali Adri Sakum. In furtherance to the topic, let's look at the correlational aesthetics of sustainable form in artificial intelligence. AI has often been heralded as the key enabler for the design and construction of buildings with the most optimal environmental performance, most resourceful material and structure utilization, and most rapid and safe on-site assembly, most seamless decision-making design pipeline, and most accurate cost profit estimation, and the list goes on. There is a need to address human factors that are 
often more difficult to measure in sustainable terms, such as those relating to the culture and social. The coming up topic will attempt to explore and articulate the aesthetics and sustainable forms, drawing insight from artificial intelligence, neurosciences, philosophy, art, design, and architecture through the lens of the human machine, creativity, and computability. Yes, last but not least, our third panelist, Dr. Emmanuel Kaur, holds a joint appointment as an assistant professor in architecture and sustainable design, ASD, and design and artificial intelligence, DAI, at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUTD, where he now directs artificial architecture. He obtains his PhD between the School of Computer Sciences and Institute of Architecture at EPFL, which is Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne, a research institution in Lausanne, Switzerland. Please welcome to our last speaker of today, Dr. Emmanuel Kaur. Thanks. Um, right. Thanks uh, for the nice uh, introduction. Um, sorry, uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yeah. Right. So thanks. Um, thanks again uh, for this uh, opportunity to share my thoughts about um, sustainability. So um, I'm assistant professor at the SUTD. Um, my lab is uh, in the disciplinary research laboratory. Um, sorry, can I check if, if you are actually seeing the screen? Yeah? Okay. Sorry. Um, so sorry for the... Uh, The slight delay. Yes, so um, at the SUTD, I'm teaching it in both departments, both uh, the quiet pillar, um, the artificial, the artificial, um, the design artificial intelligence, uh, uh, the pillar, and also the um, architecture and sustainable design pillar. So let me move uh, more quickly to um, the topic of today. Um, so. Often the criteria for judging a well-designed building will typically consist of these three factors, cost, performance, aesthetics. Yet with sustainable and green building design, the last factor has often been deemed as rather less important, partly due to its uh, qualitative nature that defies much of objective quantitative assessment. In fact, we often make a linguistic difference when we said um, when we make a difference between a good building and a piece of great architecture. So aesthetics seems to be the key differentiating factor when we speak of good building and great architecture. This reminds me of what the uh, Roman architect and engineer of the uh, wrote in, the, uh, in one of the most important, in fact, probably the most important architecture treatise, uh, the Architectura during the first century BC, that all buildings should have that three attributes of strength, utility, uh, and beauty. Or in, in Latin, it would be called fia uh, uh, mitas, uh, utilitas, and uh, venustas. So presumably, the last one, meaning uh, venustas, beauty, would refer to aesthetics, and by extension, human well-being, such as psychologically and neurologically, um, so one of the earliest attempts in addressing the importance of aesthetics uh, within sustainable design was this book uh, by Lenz Ose, uh, titled The Shape of Green, Aesthetics, Ecology, and Design. Um, and it was published in uh, 2012, almost nine years ago. In the book, he posed the question of, uh, but what about aesthetics? Does sustainability change the phase of design or own is its content? And he suggests that if it is not beautiful, it is not sustainable. Beauty could save the planet. So my question then is whether there is a possibility to measure, evaluate, and hopefully to then generate for sustainable design that are also aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing. Apparently such 
uh, there are actually two domains uh, that is of particular interest to us uh, for today's discussion, that is neuroarchitecture and neuroaesthetics. Drawing from the work of art critic uh, Clive Bell uh, and in combination with his own empirical work in neurobiology at the UCL, University College London, uh, Professor Zemir Zeki established this new domain of uh, known as neuroaesthetics in the early 1990s. First in his 1993 book called The uh, A Vision of the Brain and then followed by his 1999 book titled Inner Vision, an Exploration of Art and Brain. Um, so in, in that sense, if we look at uh, the notion of significant form that um, what neuroaesthetic is trying to claim is that there exists actually a mapping between our sense of beauty and, or pleasure and the artwork itself. Or in our case, the artwork would be the piece of architecture, the design artifact of a building. Um, Clive Bell, for instance, said that the lines and colors and in the ways in which lines and colors are being combined in a certain way actually stir a specific aesthetic um, emotions. And, and if you look at this diagram from uh, Zima Zeki, he actually mapped empirically the parts of the brain, which is the visual cortex, um, that get triggered when one looks at, say, a Mondrian painting. And the second domain that is of interest is neuroarchitecture, which is rather new, a new paradigm which mix, is a mix of architecture and neuroscience that likewise suggests that there exists an underlying relationship between our brains and the built environment. It is an architecture that is concerned with uh, the essential well being of its inhabitants. So, in that sense, it is designing. Um, as as uh, uh, Ian uh, Ritchie wrote uh, in his book, Designing with the Mind in Mind. Now, going back to the, um, the sustainable uh, development goals, um, well, given the limited time that I have, I'll show a few research projects that, that will focus on the consumption uh, as perception and the production as design of sustainable aesthetics. It is a process characterized by the interaction between human and environment as interfaced by the apparatuses of AI. More specifically, these uh, projects will attempt to address this UN SDG number 11, um, top banner on the slide, the sustainable cities and communities through the forms of cities and communities via the designing for participation, uh, perception, and uh, parameterization. So the, uh, one project uh, is uh, the road project, uh, I could call it the road. Um, according to the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization, 40 of the 50 countries with the highest road traffic deaths are in fact African. Um, compared to Europe, uh, Africa has 10 times fewer cars and yet three times higher road traffic deaths. Uh, in this project, uh, it is like an alternative to Google Map in that it doesn't just show the shortest uh, route from uh, point A to point B, it shows the safest one to take. Using a deep neural network to segment any given satellite imagery into safe and unsafe pixels, safe in this case is measured by the infrared distribution of the paved roads and dirt roads. Um, the site menu, uh, you could see that it's ranking which are the possible uh, itinerary that you can take to ensure it is a safe uh, path. Um, so in, in that sense, um, so from here I could see that the green, uh, the red pixels represent unsafe uh, routes, roads, while blue and green represent safe roads. And therefore the dynamic crowd source participatory reform, ref, uh, reformation of existing infrastructure via AI remote sensing, uh, there is this potential to provide the safety and well-being and aesthetic experience of the city. Um, in this case, what, what is your image of a city? The image of a city is not about what one see, uh, sees on the city map, but what and how one experiences uh, the city space. For example, on the left is a drive-through for those who've been in Singapore before, uh, one of the streets in Singapore, and on the right, an AI model train uh, in my lab to try to extract the most spatially and perceptually relevant information as in the ways in which an artist would abstract 
and represent a space. But what I would like to show here is an ongoing project instead, uh, this, uh, known as, um, which is related to neural architecture, um, the design methods to understand public perception of space uh, with the use of machine learning. So more specifically is to measure the sediments of polarity scores with uh, natural language processing in machine learning and also eye tracking um, with visual heat maps um, uh, showing the gaze patterns and the fixation time. So two areas are shown here uh, in a minute, uh, Geylang Road and Kongsiats Road. Um, actually on the top left of the slide, you could see how the device uh, is being worn by uh, the human subject. Not very interesting at all, it looked like any other pair of glasses. Um, so in this case, uh, what we see here is um, that, that the on the top row, uh, we see the full gaze fixation matrix for different areas of interest. And the, the, middle, the middle row shows two heat maps uh, overlaid on the corresponding scene, representing fixation duration from the eye tracking data analysis. The bottom row instead shows the plot, uh, the plot of uh, polarity scores, meaning whether this is um, the pedestrian see this as a positive or a negative space uh, and its um, connotation culturally and socially via uh, uh, online survey. Uh, that we then aggregate uh, and use language process, natural language processing to understand the sentiments. This is the real one for the uh, Zhongxiang Road. Quite different. For instance, in this case, you can see that uh, unlike Geylang Road, which itself is um, rather without much um, governmental urban intervention, here uh, in Zhongxiang Road, we actually see uh, much more artistic uh, design interventions such as the neural um, on the end wall of a shop house uh, in this image. And um, on the contrary, um, um, so we could see that uh, if you look at the case pattern, these are in fact affecting the ways in which one would look at this building, the space and experience it. And so therefore the quantitative use of eye tracking with machine learning could play a key role in understanding or sustained perception of architectural forms. And these are the project which is about uh, moving from the city to the interior of a museum is uh, an app that allows one to say, if I have five, 10 minutes to go to visit this exhibition, and I would like to have certain emotions to be selected, I, it would automatically generate this itinerary. So the idea is to use emotion uh, recognition AI models to understand the interaction among humans, artworks, and gallery spaces. So the underlying premise is that what if paintings would see the emotions of museum visitors? What if paintings could have emotions too, like humans? You could replace the word paintings with architecture, with walls, with spaces as well. Um, in, uh, I, because of the time, I just move on quickly uh, with this. Um, I just kind of scrub this. So the idea is that every uh, paintings would be analyzed um, and score according to the uh, emotion analysis of the effect upon someone. So the perception of an artwork uh, being stored. And with that, we could do an aggregation to score every single painting based on the, uh, the, the um, emotional um, um, uh, consequences experienced by someone. And then we could then plot it, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry for the, the time is a bit short. I don't want to overrun. And last project, which is uh, the AI Sampling Singapore project, currently exhibited at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Uh, let me go quickly. Is the idea to sample buildings and therefore using that as a design methods to understand. Uh, so here, the idea is to um, sample a building forms rather than designing building from scratch. Um, and in that sense, inheriting cultural, socially embedded aesthetics of built forms. So here in this case, we're looking at different forms, uh, understanding the distribution, the style using deep learning uh, to understand uh, the similarity and differences. So from here, for instance, um, the deep learning generative model, um, learn about 3D models and from there understand their, their uh, uh, features. So from there, we could start to then uh, create a, a design search space that is so theoretically infinite that these buildings could be automatically generated with AI and yet retaining the um, features of those uh, 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 training, which in this case, the housing development board and the uh, condominiums in Singapore. 
And likewise, we could do a section cut to understand the spatial interiority of these uh, architectural buildings. Um, so this is the, the AI model searching that, in that space of, uh, of uh, features and 3D print and yeah, thanks. Uh, so if, if you want to know more, you could check uh, me on the uh, on the website, on the SUTV website uh, at the, yeah, under the faculty page, thanks. Amazing. A series of projects are used to illustrate how artificial intelligence could be used for mapping sustained visual perception in urban spaces, synthesizing formal and visual familiarity in the generated design, and more importantly, appropriating emotion uh, analysis for creative uh, engagement in the culture space. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Emmanuel Kaur. Right, um, gentlemen, now let's turn to the open discussion. Right, to all panelists here, we elaborate the emerging concept of sustainable innovation and analyze the relevance of innovation as a means to solve wicked problems and enhancing sustainable well-being. We also examine the changing condition for innovation creation, building global knowledge hubs and local innovations ecosystem. As a result, the drivers of the innovation and opportunities to utilize the untapped innovation potential of people outside traditional innovation contexts are expanded and diversified. Right, the questions here to all panels. What are the principles of strategies to promote well-being through sustainable design? How can the luminous environment support well-being in your practice? Anyone want to go first? Yeah, uh, I can go first. I think... Okay. Uh, the concept of well-being, I think, is integrated into sustainable design. Uh, why I say this is because that um, if you look at a comparison between uh, a previous way of looking into design or looking into development, it is more infrastructure derived. Yeah, but if you look at uh, ways that we are doing cities now or buildings now, we are more human centric, and we are looking at. Uh, people rather than the infrastructure. A uh, good example is uh, years ago, people would design for the car first rather than the, the people who are living there, simply because that was the the uh, the dream at that time, the, the technological uh, aspiration at that time. But now we know better that uh, human well-being uh, is the utmost uh, important and uh, cities that are or uh, designs of buildings that are not thought out in this way uh, is not just non-sustainable, not just in a, in an environmental sense, but also in in a, in a more social and humanistic sense. Yeah. So I think uh, the best is to look at people first, and then uh, automatically well-being will be uh, an end product of it. Right. Thank you, Sally. Uh, People-centric. Um... What about Fuad? What's your thought? Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, in terms of the uh, system design, uh, I mean, I, I would like to talk about the the uh, from the drone point of view. Uh, the application of drone as uh, right now uh, uh, is go beyond that uh, uh, we think before. So um, uh, basically. Uh, right now, what we done in uh, our industry is that we use drone uh, to help the the, for example, to help the construction industries in terms of uh, pre planning of the of the site, for example. So uh, from the beginning of the uh, development of the uh, uh, areas, we do a, a prelim uh, mapping uh, in order for us to to uh, uh, or we call that uh, to determine. Uh, to to uh, to project uh, anything that can be goes wrong uh, before we build the, the the whole system or the whole uh, building so uh, the application or the usage of drones uh, indirectly actually it helps a lot it helps a lot of uh, uh, in terms of uh, for example uh, monitoring the uh, the design for example the construction itself uh, whether the, the construction uh, the physical construction is uh, according to the design uh stage so this is what we have uh doing right now we are using a lot of drones 
to do the monitoring of the construction from the beginning and compare to the actual uh, design. And then we plot it into the 3D models and uh, by using, uh, for example, a software or a concept or for example, like a building information model. So this is what a uh, drone can contribute to the, uh, what we call it a uh, sustainable uh, uh, design in terms of construction. Okay, great. For thank you so much uh, from the drone tech point of view, Emmanuel. Yeah. What are your thoughts? All right, thanks, uh, Stephen. So, um, actually, if you think about how things been kind of, there's this spectrum in sustainable thinking. Previously, uh, is about restorative. It's about just basically recycling or conservation. But now we're moving towards this idea of regenerative design, meaning it is not just reducing to just zero but we're actually evolving with the nature with the system as a participant so in that sense i think um going back to this human centeredness is not just about i suppose just analyzing the peer but actually have them participate uh it's probably more common in 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 the west where um city dwellers are asked to be to participate in about uh, in urban planning for instance or i think because they're essentially the stakeholders and you have to sustain in that sense the interest the the, the involvement uh or even the rights of the of the user meaning the the the, the city dwellers and therefore this notion of participation this understanding of their perception of the city uh would eventually even go beyond what the urban designer could think of urban planner could plan for um and i think that would be actually very exciting thanks thanks emmanuel question uh for Ford. drones also have privacy and other ethical implications when used for research if people or their practices are identifiable from the research data should the people involved be asked for their consent to be surveyed from the air Okay, thank you, Dr. Stephen. Um, okay, uh, right now, um, for uh, industry practice, uh, is that uh, we have to uh, request for uh, consent from the, the the people or the areas, uh, the owners of the land, for example, that where we are going to 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 capture the data, for example. So, in terms of research and development, also we have to do a PDRA, what we call it a pre uh, predefined risk assessment. Uh, whereby we need to uh, look uh, into uh, details on how drones can impact uh, uh, towards the the public or even to the stakeholders on that particular areas. So we need to do uh, a research. We do we need to do analysis and then um, uh, try to mitigate uh, uh, the risk uh, so that uh, at the end we will get uh, better results. So uh, because drone is actually we are talking about safety. So that's the number one. So before you're flying, we have to make sure that everything is in good manner and uh, we don't want to uh, harm any people or even, or even animals. So we need to do a very thorough process or analysis to ensure that uh, 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 to be happen. Yep. Great. Um, according to what you have just said, what might be done with the data and could there be a negative repercussions for the people involved? For example, if data on the farming practices collected by the drone review illegal forest clearance, will the data be passed on to the law enforcement agency and might that result in harm to the person on the ground? Yep. Uh, in terms of data, of course, uh, uh, we were talking about the data uh, integrity, actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, once uh, we do a, a specific uh, project or specific uh, works on uh, particular areas, for example, on the agriculture or mapping areas, so we need to define the boundaries, actually. We need to define the boundaries and then uh, where we can fly and where we cannot fly. So from that, uh, we have to make sure that all the data that we capture, we cannot uh, just simply uh publish or just simply deliver to anybody else except for those who are own the the, the rights of the data actually so in terms of the for example in law enforcement uh, all the data that we need to uh, that we captured uh we need to uh 
give back to the to the authorities for example uh, JUPAM uh, Jabatan Ukur Pemerintah Malaysia so every time we fly uh, we apply a permit from them and then uh, we have to revert back all the data to them so that uh, they can uh, uh, analyze or they can monitor what we have uh, taken before okay okay thank you thank you for for the insight yep. okay question for Sally the hard truth right. is that all buildings have a carbon footprint according to what you said a building's right. carbon footprint is defined as the amount of the co2 which is the, the carbon dioxide and it produces during its operational activities considering the building's carbon footprint is something that affect both construction as well as existing buildings so by educating ourselves we will be able to ensure that the building design has the smallest negative impact possible on the environment so what is the zero carbon building standard according to because there's so many different requirements so according to your practice so what is the zero carbon building uh, standard who can uh, use the standard i think what what the 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 complicated thing about carbon is as many aspects uh yeah. especially when you talk about uh, the two aspects one is operational what you mentioned just now and there's also, yeah. also an aspect of embodied carbon meaning the carbon that is inherent in the building materials that you use for construction say for example uh, a tile that comes locally from the local factory is not going to have the same carbon footprint as a tile imported from china or europe because that's going to take a lot of fuel and the carbon footprint will be larger hence um, but when we talk about zero carbon it's uh, pretty easy to understand because zero means that you are using you are uh, having no carbon footprint and you can achieve this uh, of course you say how is it possible well uh, then the idea of offsets uh, come into uh, come into play whereby you can offset uh, whatever uh, extra costs or minimum costs where you go down to a certain level but you there of course you have to have some sort of minimum and then you can offset that to become zero so to, but to determine at what level and whatnot is the the, the conversation that we're having now internally in creation creating this grading system and uh I'm, and once it's you once it's out it can be used for it can be used by uh, everybody in the industry because it's tagged to our our local practices and also tied to our national reporting. What is the current status of the carbon footprint measurement? Uh, it, we hopefully by the end of the year, we will have it out uh, the first part anyway, because uh, I think the uh, I showed you the four criteria. I think the easiest for us is energy as energy is the uh, low hanging fruit for how would I say uh, for operational carbon because basically the, the bulk of the energy that your building use is the one that is coming out of the electricity meter and we have very good data on uh, in energy production in malaysia by tnb and of course uh, agencies like seda also publish their uh, their data so uh, that would be the the lowest hanging fruit in in terms of uh, calculating the carbon well, that's very nice, actually. Sorry. So, what can humans to do to decrease the amount of the carbon being released into the carbon cycle? Uh, anybody, every everyone. I think the first thing is people should be aware of what what it is, and uh, that every decision that you make has some impact uh, to in in creating or in propagating. Uh, a carbon footprint for example uh, a simple thing like breakfast for example uh, having a local breakfast uh, has a lesser carbon footprint than having a imported breakfast from uh, oranges from spain uh, or uh, uh, food from china I, uh, those kind of exotic things actually uh, uh, has a huge carbon footprint and that is linked because carbon is an indicator for the general sustainability it is linked to a whole other set of issues like food security and food waste whereby when you transport food over long distances uh, there is a huge amount of waste yeah so um, the best thing to do for an average person is to be aware of what uh, each and everything that you're doing uh, has a carbon footprint and what 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 footprint uh, should you? There's a uh, online calculators for personal use actually to to see uh, how much carbon you actually uh, generate. 
So you can, you can just Google it out. <laughs> <laughs> Google, Googleization always works. Isn't it? Wow, it's <laughs> impedimus, um, which is a, a confirmation bias, I put it this way. But we need to have a little bit of, which is a, a referencing and also and, uh, in cross check is the best in order to confirm the information what we yeah. treat is, is all conf- uh, which is available right no, um, I'm talking oh. about the general, general public <laughs> if you are, not, not, not yeah, an yeah. academic or, or industrial <laughs> thing <yeah. laughs> oh, thank you Sally okay uh, Emmanuel a question for Emmanuel okay um, um, amazing presentation I must, I must say Emmanuel okay there's something come across in my mind about the architectural styles or architectural static are very powerful tools for expressing the very core values custom emotion thoughts and philosophies of a culture or society the emergence of the each architectural style was a result of a great shift in humanity's ways of life according to what you just had mentioned there. The new incremental technological changes created a human development path that reached a level which is no longer sustainable. Sustainability became possibly the most important motto of our age. However, to pronounce sustainable architectural style, an aesthetic that would communicate the underpinning philosophies, thought, emotions, and value is yet to emerge. What are the potential long-term impacts of AI on, sustainable, uh, or, um, AI on sustainability and more specifically on sustainable development? Right, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, uh, Stephen, for the question. I think the long-term, well, as you mentioned, architecture, I mean, I'll, I'll probably talk about architecture specifically and also maybe uh, urban design because it's closer to my, my domain of research. So you, you can think of, um, if you think of in terms of the AI tools, it, it has dramatically changed the way we work as designers and, and architects. Because I mean, even if you think about it before, before that, before the emergence of AI, this digitization itself has dramatically changed, right? Even the workforce itself. So there is a shift and this new uh, revolution from AI is not to be, I think, uh, belittled um, because of maybe the general public ignorance, uh, indifference, or lack of interest of it. Um, so in that sense, is the cognitive as well. So the 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 design cognition of the des- uh, of the uh, designers planners um, would be affected, and and that has actually not just an environmental long term impact is and long-term impact on the human themselves. And, and if we link it back to, um, so therefore uh, the, learn, the long-term impact is on both uh, domain, right? Humans and, and the environment. And when I talk about aesthetics, it's not so much about the, the style, but rather it's essentially human, right? Aesthetics, because it is, is linking the culture, the social, and, and the various aspects of pretty much what you call yourself, why you call yourself a human, because you have these strange needs. I mean, a standard example would be um, someone when asking about, even if you get, I mean, just going along with Sally's uh, lecture, let's say you get zero carbon, you get, you know, these perfect numbers. What's next, right? If you think about the amount, the, the, the we have different needs, right? This hierarchy of needs. So, would you be happy? Would you want to drink a, a glass of orange juice or just get a capsule, right? Just have it in got all your vitamin C and whatsoever. So, in, in that sense, um, we have to be aware of that to steer the long term consequence or the, the long term direction of, of AI and sustainable design together. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I answer the question. <laughs> but it's okay. It just uh, I'm just uh, trying to look at uh, what how important of the numerical impact to to our the way how we live because we always constantly looking at the numbers. If it just like seems to be the number is is the final decision to the way how we respond to the surrounding. So it's the same thing like what you just mentioned about Sally. What he said about all these index and all is quite scary. We look at the numbers. It's kind of like I'm not sure whether. Uh, of course, uh, the numbers is the is the is the, is the indication. 
it is an important, it is an indication, definitely. Okay, but you have mentioned the awareness, awareness. I think. I it think is, it's all the it awareness. Is, yeah. the, the number yeah. help to raise awareness. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's just, uh, yeah. No, because people, so, don't, I know. people don't understand numbers. If you give an uh, example just now, like for example, the trillion do trillion square feet uh, increase, nobody would understand what a trillion square feet means. But if you say like it's a <laughs> fort, uh, a fort, uh, uh, New York every month, uh, it, it rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, it's and this is what designers are good at doing. They, they are able <laughs> to somehow visualize like what Sally did really well mm. by saying, you know, every month you get a new Manhattan, right? And this is very clear. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay, um, you have mentioned about aesthetic earlier on. Uh, how might AI be conveyed to architects to help them to understand aesthetic needs of human? Right, so the, the architects first have to move on to this new paradigm, right, of designing. So rather than drawing, you're actually, I mean, the example I show you is based on this large train, thousands of buildings in 3D. Right, that the model learn, but then it could generate in theory infinite. But whether you like it or not, you have eventually you have to curate and see which are the more pleasing ones. So I think that is a shift in workflow. Um in, in that sense. So architects, I mean, now we're just talking about the early design stage, which in fact plays a huge a tremendous role in the potential reduction of say carbon footprint or the eventual effects or consequence of the built form, the building. So the, the, these tools are very powerful, um, but I, I think the the discipline is still kind of new to this, kind of even at times naive about it, and lack criticality of when not to use it and when to use it uh, in in the in the best best context. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. This is very exciting, actually. Uh, all, all the things you have just shared with us. But I never forget Fuad. Fuad, you are still here, right? Fuad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fuad, I have something to ask you, actually. What can be done to minimize the social risk of conservation drones? Okay, uh, there's a lot of things that uh, we can uh, start to think of. Uh, firstly, the training. Okay, the training, uh, the operators, uh, the user, the user of the drones itself must go through a proper training okay and then uh, when after uh, he got uh, uh, proper training then comes the ethics right uh, and after that we go for the next level whereby uh, uh, the process of application uh, or the process of uh, 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 data acquisition uh, is correct so uh, whenever the, the person or the pilot, we call it a drone pilot right now, uh, want, to, want to operate a drone. So he must go through this kind of training and he must go through a process uh, so that he, have, he, he had a, a, a very uh, equipped uh, knowledge and also a practical uh, uh, skills. And then uh, again, from the law point of view, uh, the agencies, okay, they must have a proper system on how to to to, to determine or how to uh, to ensure that those pilots or those or those are users are uh, competent in that uh, uh, specific uh, application. So, for example, um, uh, if you want to to fly a drone uh, in agriculture, uh, what are the competency level or what are the competencies uh, set? Uh, skill sets that are uh, requires for a uh, uh, specific uh, uh, application of agriculture and it is different from the other uh, industries uh, like uh, 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 if you fly for for construction industries so they must have a different uh, kind of uh, skill set so those users or pilots must have gone through a very proper training uh, in order to uh, uh, to to fully uh, uh, I mean, uh, to get the very good uh, results of the uh, applications. Yep. Okay, thank you for that. Um, now I have a question for all. How to connect well-being research with sustainable practice and standards? Anyone want to go? Anyone want to go first? Sal, want to try? No, I mean, I mean like uh, the idea of uh, I think. Uh, the World Green Building Council, they had a, a, a worldwide 
uh, sort of campaign called Better Places for People. And uh, it is an uh, emphasis of well-being uh, uh, in terms of sustainable uh, design. And I think uh, a lot of countries actually, uh, because of this, shifted towards uh, a lot of research on well-being. Like, for example, here in Malaysia, uh, Malaysia GGBC, we funded, we gave grants, in fact, to uh, to many universities. I think we gave to uh, UKM to conduct research, for example, on indoor uh, air quality, uh, on uh, 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 satisfaction of people in green buildings, for example, and all those kind of things. And I'm sure uh, similarly with the uh, Singapore Green Building Council has been doing that as well, because I think the idea to drive sustainability forward is that people need to have a buy-in and understand why is it important and why is it, it because Prior to that, there was an uh, idea when you go sustainable, you had to take away comfort. You know, like you, you had to, uh, oh, you yeah, want to yeah. save energy, You're you right. have to use aircraft. <laughs> so, but actually, yeah. no. Actually, the idea of sustainability is to maintain comfort, but uh, do it in a very intelligent way that you can uh, meet your goals, whereas uh, use design to and, and, and technology to ensure that uh, the environment is taken care of at the same time. Yeah. Right, Emmanuel, what's your remarks on that? Right, uh, yeah, well-being itself can be something that is made to sound very ethical. I mean, it, I mean, just to kind of throw a curveball, um, this uh, Michel Duchamp, Duchamp uh, his student, uh, Arakawa, he was talking about this architecture of body, which is the deliberate idea of making some kind of a discomfort in the environment just so that they will exert their body i mean the the, the idea is that if they're too comfortable your body could potentially deteriorate right but if you are made to move and it's uncomfortable but in the long run it acts it's actually good for your body and which links to those who are familiar with architecture theory the um uh, claude Bachon, uh, the french architect he talks about the oblique so typically we talk about architecture floor as this flat floor, but this idea of the oblique actually create yeah. mm. acceleration and velocity in the body to create long-term comfort as well in that sense, in that sense. Right. But anyway, this this is more like a a different discourse, maybe more in the in the art world as well. Uh, but, but, but in, but in it's terms of well being it's not manual. So, I mean, like it's the same thing with staircases and lifts. I mean, uh, whether you adopt a staircase or a lift. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I think most people would choose to take the lift. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right, actually. So, um, so for what? What about you? What is your thought on that uh, in terms of uh, um, connect well-being research with sustainable practice and standards? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, the, the awareness is more important. Uh, uh, I mean, the public awareness, uh, uh, the paradigm shift of the, the current practice um, um, in industry, for example. Uh, a lot of people, or even a lot of industries that we have gone through, uh, for example, we want to introduce the usage of new technology in, in certain industries. They are something like they are quite reluctant. I don't know why. So maybe they, they feel that uh, they are not confident or maybe they feel that uh, something is a threat for them, a new thing is a threat. Uh, replacement. Yes, I, 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 <laughs> replacement, yes. I have I I been read uh, about that. Uh, some companies, they don't want to use uh, this kind of you know, technology because um, for them, uh, it will uh, give them, uh, uh, for example, a replacement for their, for their employees. So uh, it will create, uh, um, they're reducing the, the number of workers, uh, but then actually it's creating a new kind of job actually. Uh, higher tech uh, knowledge uh, kind of job. So um, that's a, that's an issue whereby uh, some areas or some industries, they are, they are, they are not capable to, to go further into <coughs> this kind of uh, uh, technology because they don't have a, a correct people. Uh, to do uh, the all the all the jobs uh, because it's, it requires a higher higher skill of set so that's why i said uh, the the most important is uh, we start with awareness to the public uh, to the industries on how they can adapt this this uh, ai technology and how it can help us uh, uh, to reduce uh, a lot of um, um, uh, challenges that are problems that are being induced before so in the long run it's actually is very good uh, but I, again, uh, awareness 
maybe um and then the training uh and um i believe one day uh they will know but it's quite late lah five to ten years ago why why we do start earlier or something like this <laughs> so that kind well, of it's never too late <laughs> it's never too yeah. late for one <laughs> i don't remember that <laughs> yeah 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 all right okay um ultimately the success of the sustainable innovation constitute is impact on the well-being of the people and vice versa sustainable well-being is an important source of innovation and growth this discussion as to the conceptual development of the sustainable innovation and its motivation which lies in the combining competitiveness and well-being of people it includes solution anybody else would like to respond to that any comments gentlemen uh, can you repeat the question <laughs> well it's not really a question it's just my <laughs> thought of that it's just like sustainable innovation constitute the impact of the well-being of the people and the sustainable well-being is important of, mm. of the source of innovation growth so i think in this discussion the conceptual development of sustainable innovation at its motivation you, you have uh, cited many many example and those are the projects done by emmanuel and also by four as well which lies in the combining uh, combining with the competitiveness here so and the well-being of the people so this is an inclusive solution so do you want to respond to this uh, according to the whole discussion here yeah, I think fundamentally innovation is an integral part of uh, mm. sustainability because I think prior to sustainable movement, uh, they, building solutions were not as multidisciplinary. I think sustainability mm. has forced uh, many, many disciplinaries like what we see here today. I mean, like uh, we see what from a drone company, we see Manuel for looking at it, almost quantifying aesthetics and, and looking at new ways to to push the AI technology further, uh, the, the need to uh, to be better and to save our environment and to, to create mm -hmm. better futures is a driving force uh, to create innovation. I think that I think that, that one is on a fundamental level true for, for everybody. Yeah. Thanks, for the, thanks for the comment and remarks. What about others? All good? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Sally. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, very good point. Okay. Uh, yep. Emmanuel, any final thought from you before we um, close the discussion? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think is this sustainable design makes it interesting because you somehow force the, or well, in the case of building industry, you force the architect to work a bit, <laughs> a lot more closely with the, the other other people from the other domains and therefore enriching it um, but again i'm always a bit cautious about um when to make it completely quantitative uh although i think that, that's important but you know ar architects they they are supposed to be the, the designer to somehow go beyond beyond the the quantifiable in that sense right the, this sensibility uh, of of understanding of people how people interact with the environment. I mean, these are in human in intuition, which AI at this point in time can't actually replace uh, that kind of skill set. Yeah, but I, I look forward, uh, Emmanuel, to a future when I can tell the computer, hey, I need uh, um, a door that looks Baroque, uh, or uh, I, I, I need a modernist frontage uh, so that it automatically generates <laughs> something. Now you know, Sally, we are in the loop now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So are, that, that, I think uh, it's not replacing architects or being yeah, a yeah, exactly, architects. Yeah. I think it is becoming a tool to help uh, to help all of us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We are all we are all in the loop, so we are attached and in the loop. Great. Thank you very much. And so first of all, I'd like to thank all the esteemed panels, indeed the wonderful audience uh, who, had, uh, who had clearly tuned in. Stay until now. I think I'm going to summarize the conversation. So despite the discussion on sustainable innovation, further research is needed to tackle such issues as their, no, uh, their notional definition towards construct clarity, formulas that combine integrated viability with environmental and social ones, context and conditions that can promote the development of sustainable innovation, knowledge and skill to develop sustainable solutions, sustainable products and services, impacts on the regional development. With that, thank you so much, Mr. Muhammad Fouad, 
Muhammad Isa, Esko of Mudas, Malaysia Amen Drones Activist Society, Architect Sali Adresakum, Past President of MGBC, Malaysia Green Building Council, last but not least, Dr. Emmanuel Kaur, Assistant Thanks. Professor at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUTD. For this insightful discussion, we have come to the end of this session. Gentlemen, it is absolute my honor as well as privilege to have you all here. ISO Plaza series organized by Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. Till then, take care and each other. Have a wonderful evening. I see you soon. For the Malaysian audience, happy National Day. Yeah, happy National Day, everybody. Happy National Day. <laughs> thank, thank you, you guys. Happy National Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.